at the University and the Cancer Center. She's the Associate Director for Health Equity and Community Outreach and, Outreach and Engagement. She's in the Graduate School of Public Health in the School of Nursing. She does all kinds of things, but today she's going to talk mm -hmm. a bit about local cancer disparities. Um, so I think it's Alrighty. Good to talk. So thank you, well, Dr. Robertson. Oh, thank you. And thanks for all your help. All right, you can go to the next screen, please. And this is just a little bit of an overview of the things we're going to talk a little bit about. I'm going to give you some basic definitions at, on health, determinants of health, health disparities, equity and inequity, and the factors that contribute to it, how, to, how they're being, you can reduce them, and what we're doing locally. And most of you probably, if you've been tuned in to the media and what's going on in our world, what's going on at Pitt, what's going in the, on in the healthcare system, you're hearing a lot about health inequities and disparities at this point in time. So this is very timely. Next slide, please. So you can see the world, whoops. <laughs> The World Health um, Organization definition of health. And I think this is very important. It's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being. So we're not just talking about the absence of disease or infirmity, we're talking about complete, the complete being, all components. Next slide, please. Uh, public health, which has really been in the media also, particularly with COVID, is the science and art of protecting and improving the health of communities. So not just one individual, populations, communities. And they do that through education, the promotion of healthy lifestyles, and research for disease and injury prevention. The focus of public health is prevention of the things we just talked about. Next slide. So determinant health, determinants of health come into play. These are factors that contribute to a per person's current state of health. And I'm gonna go over all of them. There are biological ones, socioeconomic, psychosocial, behavioral, and social ones in nature. And they impact each and every one of us and our health and well-being. Next slide, please. So biologically, when we talk about biologic, you think about the genetics or inheritance. And these generally are not things that can be changed. They will um, impact one's lifespan very often, one's general health, or, and one's chance of developing certain illnesses or diseases. So you hear people have a predisposition to high blood pressure, diabetes, maybe some types of cancers that are more along the genetic line. Gender also comes into play. Men and women are prone to different types of diseases and also at different ages throughout their lifespan. Next slide, please. Socioeconomic factors come into play and, and play largely on a lot of things, not just health. One's income and social status, the higher the income and the social status, generally the better one's health status is for many, many reasons. There are resources available um, and there are a lot of these resources and the ability to access care, et cetera, then decreases stress and there's a whole continuum that come into play. We also have to consider living conditions and I'll go more into our depth on that. Access to care and education. Lower educational levels are generally linked with poorer health, generally due to more stress and lower self-confidence, and many other factors that I'm sure you could think about. Next slide, please. Psychosocially, uh, social support networks come into play. Family, friends, and community impact one's health. We're hearing a lot about that right now, that people being isolated or sequestered and how that is impacting a lot of their psychosocial or their mental health. Uh, those that have support networks or find ways to get supported, and it doesn't always have to be face-to-face, -face, are linked to better health. Culture also affects one's health. There are customs and traditions, beliefs of the family and the community, and you can think about sort, certain things. I'm out in the community. A lot of my work is community-based, at least was before COVID, and in certain populations, when I talked about screening women for cervical cancer, 
the male came into play and he had a big impact as to whether or not that woman could be screened. And if she could, he very often had to be present. So that's different than what we're used to. So you really have to be aware of those things and work with them. Next slide. Then there's behavioral factors. These are things we generally look at and say, individuals can have control over these. But lots of, again, lots of things still come into play. So this is personal behavior. Are you a risk taker? Do you do things that may endanger your health? One's diet, exercise, I'll go more into depth on some of these, use of alcohol, drugs, and tobacco, maintaining a healthy weight, getting the proper amount of sleep, how does one manage stress, and does one have coping skills? Next slide. So when we look at our physical environment, uh, you have to think about this and, and just take a few minutes and think about communities. Think about the communities surrounding even Shadyside or Pittsburgh. And I'm sure you can identify some communities that may have, well, Pittsburgh is known for not having the cleanest air. So that's, think about you know healthy workplaces, safe houses, uh, good roads, are there communities that you're aware of that people really can't go out and walk and get exercise because they don't feel safe? Or maybe they live in environments where there may be rodents, there may be bugs, there may be other things, uh, lead paint. So those things all impact one's health, employment and working conditions. People who are employed are generally healthier, but it also is important that they have some control over their working conditions. And that's from many different venues. Um, you know, maybe the hours they work, what they're exposed to, what type of work they're doing, and also discrimination comes into play here. Next slide. So then we talk about health services in general and access. And so often we take for granted, particularly you know, in the United States is that everyone has equal access to health care. And that's not true. In many, many of the areas that I work in, there aren't available health care services. People have to travel miles. They live more rurally or what they have available to them is very limited. Maybe they don't have insurance. Um, or what services they do have available, preventative services aren't available, and the services to treat, treat disease are limited. In order to maintain health, it is important that individuals have routine physical exams. They get the various vaccines or immunizations that are recommended for themselves and their children, and also healthcare screenings of various sorts, not just cancer. Next slide, please. So when we talk about health disparity and health inequity, disparity is inequality in age, rank, condition, or excellence. Inequity signifies an ethical judgment or an instance of injustice or unfairness. And that generally doesn't happen overnight. That more or less is historical and comes into play. And you'll see as I go on. Next slide. So health disparities are preventable differences in incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. And these populations are defined here, and I'm sure you are familiar with than being, dealing with race or ethnicity, gender, et cetera. And I think it's important that you keep in mind that geographic location is important. If someone lives urban versus rurally, um, immigrant status is something I deal with a lot um, in many of the areas I'm working in and also sexual orientation. Next slide. So for, to, to achieve health equity, which means attainment of the highest level of health for all people, and this is the definition by Healthy People 2020, which we're in year 2020 now, um, the requirements for, to achieve this is everyone has equal value. That's everyone in those populations I described. The focus that there's focus on 
and ongoing societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities and historical and contemporary injustices. You hear a lot now going on about those things, those injustices, those historical things that have happened. And it requires the elimination of health and healthcare disparities. Next slide. So some factors that contribute to health disparities. So we talked a little bit about socioeconomic status already, which affects the ability for anyone to get health care and the kinds of things that people with lower socioeconomic status are, are less likely to get. Um, I work in a clinic generally on Wednesdays, and in that clinic, we it really serves as a primary care clinic, and we see episodic behavior very often. So people come in, it's free, people can't be insured, so people come in when they have a situation, when they're sick, very often they don't come back for follow-up care for a multitude of reasons. Most of them are working two and three jobs but still don't have um, healthcare coverage. So you need all of these things to occur in order to put everyone on an equal playing field health-wise. You see the access to healthcare services and these are very important. Uh, we think about access as are there doctors in the area? It's beyond that. Very often you're dealing with language and literacy barriers. There's fear. A big one is people can't take time off of work. They don't have transportation to get where they need to get, either for testing or to see the doctor. And I've already talked to you about the immigrant status. That's a big thing in a lot of the populations that are out there and underserved. Next slide you see the inadequate access to care, the various things that come into play. And even very often when they get care, depending upon where they're getting their care, the care might not be up to the quality of care that other individuals are receiving or the intensity of care that's necessary for whatever disease ailment that they have. Next slide. Oh, I see a question, I'm gonna answer it. Uh, what specific challenges does immigrant status have? Well, if you are not a, um, if you're not here legally, then very often many places can see you, but they can't get you into the healthcare system for treatment because you have illegal status. In the free clinics where I work, we can do a lot, but if you have a major disease, that becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, along with that, what happens is people get scared. They're very afraid that if they come in and they see you or you know, they register and their name is on a record, that then they could be deported. So there's a lot of trust issues there. And a lot of times they've waited a long time to come have their problem dealt with because of their fear, not being legal, and um, sometimes they're even here legally, but there's a lot of language barrier and things along those lines. The one clinic I work in, and most of the areas I work in, we have the ability techno technologically to be able to work with anybody who speaks any language because we can do it all through an iPad. So what's the impact of all of this, th these healthcare disparities? Well, it does affect society as a lar at large. It also impacts future generations, because if you think about it, for instance, a young woman gets pregnant and she's living in bad conditions, doesn't have as much access to care, and this happens right here in Pittsburgh. Uh, so therefore she's stressed. Very often she has a baby before its term or preterm baby that can then go on to have a lot of health problems initially and as it's growing up, and then those generations, it just continues if people don't get out of the environment or can't get out of the environment that they currently live. Um, healthcare disparities also cost more than lives and livelihoods. You can see here one of the economic consequences just by a study done in North Carolina that estimated that the state could save $225 million a year if, dis if they dealt with the disparities in diabetes, if they could eliminate that. Next slide, please. 
So these are the different things that um, can health disparities and inequities can actually impact. And we've talked about some of those already. Next slide. Okay, here's some examples of disparities in the United States. Infant mortality, and this is something I know when I work with the Allegheny County Health Department that comes up all the time. Our black infant mortality is more than double white. Dementia, dementia, you see there, blacks have the highest risk for dementia. The can that cancer is more um, likely to occur in lower incomes and education levels. And not only do they develop the cancer, but they also die from it. So they have a higher mortality. And we see that this gap is widening. Obesity, you can see that, um, even controlling for family income and the rates of obesity in black and Mexican American men. Uh, smoking, the higher rates. Um, individuals living below federal poverty level also, and those who are unemployed, unemployed have higher smoking rates. And then binge drinking. All these are factors that impact health and not just health because of disease, but health because of risks and other things people may take doing some of these um, behaviors. Next slide. So when you think about education and dis disparities in relation to that, you see that very often related to the inequities, uh, the youth are more apt to drop out of school. And individuals with less education also very often experience increased health risks, as you can see there. Next slide. Also, um, this is um, dealing with the education also um, and the health risks that impact student performance. Very often there's more teenage pregnancy, poor dietary choices, I'm gonna get more into that, inadequate physical activity, you see the abuse, the substance abuse, and the gang, gang involvement. Next slide. So the causes of health disparities are complex, but they often result in health inequities. And at the very basis or, or behind all of this very often is how resources are distributed among different groups. So you have tangible resources such as physical parks where kids can exercise. A number of years ago, I did a study with my team in seven different communities throughout the Pittsburgh area. And we looked at actually different things that were in their environment and we did focus groups and what things were very important to those communities, whether they had them or not. And in some of the lower socioeconomic communities, the big thing they spoke about was the fact of lack of physical parks, lack of places they could go and feel safe, and they had nowhere to exercise. And they really felt strongly that this affected their health and well-being. Other resources that are intangible are being able to see a doctor when you're ill. So if you don't have health insurance or you don't have the money to pay and you don't know where there's a free clinic or there may not be a free clinic close to you, you don't have that ability to see a doctor. Sometimes it's even more than that. You can't take the time off of work to do it. So there's many root causes and there's major inequities in the US that contribute to health gaps between groups. I'm gonna go over a few of them in the next couple slides. Next slide, please. So income's a big deal. Um, we have one of the most expensive health care systems here in the US. Americans pay more for their health services and the income gap between the rich and poor continues to increase. Even though top, top income skyrocketed between 1980 and 2015, real, ra real wages for low income individuals fell which means, and meant then and even more so now, it's increasingly difficult for the poor to afford basic medical care or engage in healthy behaviors. Next slide. Um, some of this systemic discrimination or exclusion, there are social drivers that we've talked about before. There's deeply ingrained in cultural practices and norms of people that all play into this. And a lot of um, 
This may be the result of past inequities that still are affecting communities. For example, in the mid 20th century with the discriminatory housing, minority families were put into neighborhoods without access to many community resources. This has continued in some areas and we work very hard to try to equalize a lot of this um, throughout the various communities, but this has impacted future generations and past future generations over time. Next slide. Um, some environmental factors, um, some health come, outcomes are the result of personal choices. You know, the ability, eating healthy foods or getting enough exercise, but this is also shaped or influenced by our environment. So it's hard sometimes if you live in a food desert, if I'm in communities where there are no grocery stores, now, sometimes those communities have developed community gardens. That is great in the season when things are growing. And now we have, on occasion, um, various um, communities will have actually, you know, markets on the weekend or some day during the week where people can get fresh fruits and vegetables. But there are many communities, right, surrounding in Pittsburgh and out into the rural areas where it's more difficult to obtain those um, foods that help or that need to be included in a healthy diet. Next slide, please. So communities of color we know are disproportionately affected by health disparities. Next slide. And addressing health disparities, disparities is not easy, but in the next group of slides, you're gonna to start to see some of the things that we're aware of and the how we go about addressing them. So it's not easy, the causes are multi-layered and solutions need to address the root cause of the disparity and what made it possible in the first place. Next slide. So with Healthy People 2020, these were goals laid out by the US government to improve American health and reduce the health disparities. So I'm gonna go over some of the things with healthy people, what healthy people has set as goals and then get into the things we're doing locally. Next slide. So um, one of the healthy people goals was to improve economic stability by 2020. And we'll see after we're through 2020 where we're at with this, but in most instances, we haven't achieved the goals that they set. So this refers to food security, income or wealth and housing stability and employment opportunities. Um, also providing housing assistance, which improves both psychological and physical health of individuals and providing influenza vaccination in poorer neighborhoods to reduce gaps in hospitalizations due to the flu. So we do have things going on in various communities and across the state that address many of these, but it's not equal in all areas. Um, and sometimes it's just a resource issue. Next slide, please. Uh, every, ensuring that everyone receives a quality education. So there's been a lot of investment in language and literacy, early childhood education, high school graduation, et cetera, over the last 10 years. Uh, there was an increase in access to center-based early childhood education because um, this has been shown to decrease crime in teen births and high school completion programs to improve economic benefits. Next slide. Uh, there was um, Healthy People 2020 also, one of their goals was to address issues within a social and community context. So we know social influences and dynamics impact the health of individuals and the community. So things such as incarceration, discrimination, civic participation, and social cohesion. These things can be a plus or they can be a minus. Um, incarceration can disrupt families. It can impact lots of things like education, employment, and housing. Um, so there's been some researchers have actually called for policy changes that address sentences sentencing laws that disproportionately impact certain black communities in order to help reduce disparities. Next slide, please. And another goal was to expand access to healthcare and improve health literacy. And I have gone over some of that. We had the Affordable Care Act, which was great, 
But again, working where I do and, and in the communities I do, what we learned very early on was, yes, individuals could obtain insurance, but in many instances, it was very costly and they couldn't afford it. So they would rather pay the penalty, which was a lot less money, and go without the insurance. Also, we've paid a lot more attention to the health literacy, and there are still over 28 million people that lack health insurance. Next slide. And then neighborhood and built environments. We know that physical surroundings can impact individual health and well being. So, things that um, communities and um, healthy people was try were trying to improve were healthy foods, supporting healthy eating behaviors, improving quality of housing, reducing crime and violence. Um, also, we've talked about the food deserts and building partnerships between local governments and food re retailers so that communities could bring more affordable and healthier food options to their areas. Next slide, please. So my area, my area of expertise and the thing I focus most on is cancer. So NCI, we are a comprehensive cancer center at the Hillman. And an NCI priority is for us to reduce cancer health disparities. Next slide, please. So I've talked a little bit about health disparities in general, the things that impact it and um, determinants of health. So NCI defines cancer health disparities as a difference in the incidence, prevalence, and mortality and burden of cancer related to health conditions that exist among specific populations in the United States. So it's not totally different from what we've been talking about, but we're looking a lot more centering in on cancer and incidence and mortality. Next slide, please. So again, all these things come into play, even with cancer. Next slide. And again, all these factors interplay that we've been talking about. Next slide. So with cancer disparities, the things that occur um, very often, there's death from preventable cancers. There's death due to late stage cancers that could have been detected through early screening. There may be substandard treatment in cancer minority groups. There's death from curable cancers. And we see, even on an individual level, absence of pain control, offers of palliative care or availability, and hospice care. Next slide, please. So there are factors that do contribute to the health disparities in cancer, as you can see there, and I'm not gonna read them all to you, that the things we went over earlier, that we all as individuals, and this is a lot of what I do when I, I'm teaching in the community, is talk about those things individuals can have some control over. Smoking, their weight, sexual uh, promiscuity or sexual activities. Next slide, please. Um, also exposure to carcinogens. I see it on a number of community-based commun um, committees where we are working at actually identifying these things that individuals can be exposed to and working towards policy changes, plus educating them so they are more aware of the things that may contribute to not only cancer, but their health in general. Um, and access to treatment, low versus high volume um, hospitals. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just showing you um, some of the differences in the various race and ethnic, ethnic groups um, with some cancers. You see there with breast cancer, um, African-American women are more likely to die from the disease. They have most, more likely have more aggressive tumors, the highest rate of triple negative breast cancer, which is very difficult to treat. And they're most often diagnosed at later stages, but they ha are more apt to get a mammogram than their white counterparts. You can see the highest rate of mortality from cervical cancer, prostate cancer, and a variety of other things there. Next slide. Hispanics, you can see their highest rates of cancer here. Um, in dealing with um, cancers associated with infection, cervical cancer. Next slide. 
um, a- Asian Americans and pac- Pacific Islanders. Again, cancers um, of the liver and stomach, and men are twice as likely to die from stomach cancer than any other group. Next slide, please. And then American Indians and Alaska Natives. Now we don't see a lot of that here, but um, you can see the cancer is the leading cause of death in individuals over 45, and they have the poorest five-year survival. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to show you a map of the majority of our counties. Um, So my responsibility with that and that of my team and my co-director is to actually work with all of these counties within our catchment area and to work with them in dealing with the various disparities and inequities related to cancer. Next slide, please. So you can see this is for us, for the 29 counties. You can see here that are highlighted in yellow, the cancer incidence rates for us in comparison to the US, all the ones in yellow, we are higher. Same with mortality. Next slide, please. When we look at blacks versus white, blacks are our designated minority in for the Hillman Cancer Center and our network sites. Um, you can see here again, in relation to incidence and mortality that were higher than that um, with the black in comparison to the white. Next slide, please. So our work is cut out for us. That's the kind of stuff we have to address. So what we also do is constantly assess by using people, surveys, data from the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health um, and the Cancer Registry and actually look at what's going on. So we know we have a a larger amount of adult smokers. Uh, Eight counties is greater than the US median. And we also know that none of our counties, none of the 29 counties, meet the healthy people goal regarding smoking of 18, of 12%. We're much higher than that. Colorectal screening, none of our counties are at the goal. Breast cancer screening, 22 out of the 29 um, are not at the goal. HPV vaccine, we've been able to do a, a lot of work there, but we're still not where we need to be. You can also see we look at beliefs and screenings in our catchment area. Um, that in the rural counties, we know that individuals, when we survey them, are less apt to get screened because they lack the knowledge on what is the appropriate screenings or what are the appropriate screenings, how often they should get them. They often don't have primary care physicians and they are less likely to believe that health behaviors influence cancer. So such things as drinking alcohol or smoking, um, or eating a poor diet or being overweight, they don't feel that impacts um, their cancer risk. And then a big interest of mine, in addition to colorectal cancer is HPV vaccine. And I've done a lot of work and some research in that area. And we know with the rural physicians, um, HPV vaccine is a lower priority than other vaccines. And they very often speak to it in terms of sexual vaccine as opposed to it being a cancer prevention vaccine. Therefore, parents aren't as apt to have their children vaccinated. Next slide, please. Okay, and this just demonstrates what our priorities are and how we go about getting the data and community input. So it's very important that we work with our community and not just go based on data. And we have a community advisory board that also helps us strategically plan what we should do to address some of these priorities dealing with the disparities and inequities. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have a community outreach and engagement team. It's a small team, but our goal is to reduce the burden of cancer through a focused approach. So we do education, community-based, risk reduction by talking with individuals on a one-to-one basis about their risk for developing cancer. We do screening 
in the communities. And also we have a prevention and early detection suite where people can come in and get screened for free. We work at reducing barriers to care and we actually do research. Next slide. This just shows you some of the things we've been involved with as an institute um, to address some of these cancer burdens and the numbers of people we, we have reached. And we even work with the school system, educating children so that they can start to develop healthy habits. And we've had some research doing a program with uh, Dr. Chu, who is very interested in e-cigarettes and vaping and having peer support in order to decrease um, vaping and, and e-cigarette use within the schools. Next slide, please. These are, we develop all of our um, interventions, et cetera, in collaboration with communities. These are some of our community partners, but just a snapshot. Next slide, please. And this just shows you some of the things, for instance, uh, colorectal cancer screening. So in, um, it's a big issue. Um, across the nation, they set a 80% by 2019, it used to be, uh, but now it's 80% whenever of all eligible individu individuals getting screened for colorectal cancer, because we could probably eradicate 99% of all colorectal cancer if people got screened. So we actually went gun ho with um, screening efforts in 2016, and we've been able to increase from 51% to the, we're probably well over 80% at this point in time um, within our catchment area. And what we did was we educate. I'm at malls, I'm in communities, I'm everywhere, including physician offices, et cetera, encouraging that they have their um, patients screened. We understand that many individuals are not really favorable with a colonoscopy, so we can do various types of stool testing. And if individuals do need a colonoscopy and aren't insured, we have a no-cost colonoscopy program that we developed with the GI um, department. And to date, now that this was um, a little while ago, so we are probably up to close to 80 free colonoscopies that we have done. And all but one demonstrated that these individuals had precancerous polyps that needed to be removed. So that was done at the time of their colonoscopy. Next slide, please. This just shows some of the research we are doing. Uh, we've identified, and you saw there, that we have a high incidence of tobacco use and lung cancer. So different things that we are doing research-wise um, throughout our Hillman and Hillman Cancer Network um, in order to increase smoking sensation and also to decrease disparities. The Accountability for Cancer Care Study was a five-year study, and I was the local PI with the University of North Carolina, and we actually looked at um, early-stage breast and lung cancer and put some things into um, play systemically within the system, which included educating regarding um, microaggressions, implicit bias, and a variety of other things that impact care. And we were able to actually close the gap um, through navigation and education between white and black with early stage breast and lung cancer. And retrospectively, when we looked at that, our data, there was a gap between what those individuals were offered, it differed between white and black and also the compliance and that impacts outcomes. So you can see we're also dealing with radon, we're also screening um, for lung cancer, et cetera. Next slide, please. Just some of the breast related research we're doing and HPV related research. And there's lots of other research out there that we're doing in relation to cancer incidence and mortality and disparity. Next slide, please. So the other thing we have done is we wanted to make sure that our minority patients had access to clinical trials, were aware of clinical trials, and actually had individuals that they could work with and talk to that looked like them. So we have a Latino patient navigator, 
to African-American or black patient navigators and a research coordinator. And that has, we've been working really hard with them, plus with marketing to increase access, but also awareness of the importance and the availability of clinical trials uh, for not just cancer, but for prevention and early detection. In addition to that, we know that historically there's been poor rates of palliative care provided in communities and rural settings. So we actually have been doing research and some interventions where we are teaching nurses to be able to work with families right when they come in to, to the cancer clinic for their visit and help them in order to um, obtain quality end of life or quality symptom management. Uh, throughout their cancer journey. Next slide, please. This is just our phone number where people can call and schedule a free screening, can call, get additional information and work with us. We help them to find a medical home. We help them to obtain medical coverage, transportation. We also um, do follow up with everybody we touch so that individuals are navigated through their entire screening process or whatever they're involved with with us until they no longer need our services. Next slide, please. And this just shows, this is what NCI set up as some guidelines for reducing healthcare disparities. And these are the various, the various components that we have placed or developed strategically within our own program. And the next slide is just some resources. Next slide. And the final slide. Okay, hey, questions. I see three there. Whoops, I'm sorry, that you don't need that slide. <laughs> <laughs> so I do see there's a question in the chat. Uh, okay. Andrea asks, how are African-American women more likely to get late diagnoses if they're getting mammograms more? Well, that's a very good question. And that's a lot of where our research is going because it seems to be that they may come in one year and there's no sign of breast cancer. They come in the next year for their mammogram and there's a large tumor. We don't know why. Is it genetic? What has caused that tumor to really grow so large so quickly? Um, so that's a, a lot of our efforts in regards to research. It's a very good question and we don't have those answers. We really don't. Next question. Um, I have I have a question. Um, sure. Can you, can you talk more about like the efforts that are um, being made to like reduce health insurance costs? Because <laughs> like I I I looked I looked it up like during this uh, presentation, and it seems really expensive. It's very very expensive, and. You know, the Affordable Care Act was to be the answer, but that didn't change. The rates were still very high for that. What efforts that are being made and what many of us are working with is we have to change policy. We actually have to work with our, you know, our government officials, et cetera. And we know there's a lot of insurance lobbyists out there. So we have to work with our legislators. And we do that. I work... Um, with the Department of Health at the state level. And I go to Harrisburg numerous times a year and we do meet with our legislators and we talk about these very various things and how we need to start to see some of these costs come down. Um, it's not gonna happen overnight, but I think all of us, and when we vote, we have to really pay attention to these kind of things. It is a big, big issue. The clinics I serve, um, many of them have individuals that help individuals obtain insurance, and it's a struggle. It, it's really a struggle to find them something that they can afford. Um, you know, we're very, very um, happy that we have places like Birmingham Free Clinic. That's where I work on Wednesdays, and that clinic will see you as long as you don't have insurance. We try to help people get insurance, but we will continue to follow them and all the doctors there volunteer their time. And we have specialty clinics too, um, like pulmonary, um, diabetes, um, every clinic imaginable, uh, pediatrics, et cetera, um, available there. So, you know, we just have to keep pursuing along those lines. Other questions? So 
Uh, oh, go can ahead. I, can go I just like, I know there's another question in the chat. I just have a really quick follow-up. Oh, go ahead. That. So, um, if, so if you don't have insurance, but you, you like, you're educated and, and you want to get screening, like, are these free clinics the only place to do that? Oh, if you don't have insurance, no, you can, you can contact that number I put up on the screen and we will arrange for you to come into the Hillman Cancer Center. And on the ground level, we have an early detection, a prevention and early detection suite, and you can come there and get screened for free. Oh, that, that's great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So that's what I spend all the time getting out in the community and educating people about, because if I can't, you know, if they don't have clinic space, I can't screen them right there. But um, we want them to know they can get free screenings and we work with them um, if they're uninsured. So they don't have to go to the free clinic. They can come to us. And if something is found, then we work with them to get medical assistance so that they can be treated. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. That that clears it up for me. I was kind of confused, but. Thank you. That's okay. Yeah, and spread the word. We want, I mean, we're trying to do more and more marketing so people know this is available. I see another question here that says, how do you go about educating individuals on prevention and detection? Actually, prior to COVID, we're out in the community. We go to libraries, community centers, um, public housing, um, oh, the wise churches, everywhere imaginable, uh, social clubs, we, you know, we're well enough known that we get asked to come and talk on specific cancers, talking on screening and early detection, et cetera. Now with COVID and the inability to do a lot of face-to-face, -face, we're developing our whole program so we can start to do it by Zoom um, or some sort of um, virtual or remote um, abilities so that we can continue to educate and get people in and working real closely with marketing to get our number out there so people know they can call in and be screened and we will help them through this. Other questions, comments? There's lots of work to be done in this area and I hope some of you as you go on to finish high school and go on to whatever your role is, there's still we work with the basic researchers in the lab, et cetera. We're all working together to try to decrease disparities and inequities in cancer and various other diseases. So we hope moving forward that we can see things change. Anything else? Dan, Solomon, anything? No, I think, uh, are there any other questions? not then thank you lynn i really appreciate your time um no problem thank you well, you're welcome and for the students please hang on we have davin sweeney coming back at one o'clock so go take a short break at one o'clock davin's coming back to talk about essays for your college applications and how he can help you <laughs> <laughs>